Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for the word. It is the truth. We receive it written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation you're bringing for. We thank you for all that Jesus has accomplished and thank you that we're being established in what he has done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. Today, on the Hebrew calendar, actually tomorrow, is the 10th day of Tishri, which is the seventh month. And that is the Day of Atonement. We're going to talk about the prophetic fulfillment of the Day of Atonement today. Very important for you to understand the work of Jesus Christ, what he has done and what he will be doing. We begin in Leviticus 23, verse 27. This is where it speaks of the feasts of the Lord, which are God's feasts. Also on the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the, unto the Lord. And you shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement, to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. Whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work on that day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. We must understand that this particular feast is a feast that is the feast talking about judgment. It is the day of judgment, the seventh day, the tenth month. And this is a day where it says a day of atonement, where this is what it was in the Old Testament, the word, the root word for atonement is this word kafar, which means to cover or to cover over. This is commonly called Yom Kippur, but it's really talking about the covering over. It's in the peel stem, which means that it's in, means to cover over. And what is it covering over? It was covering over their sins in the Old Testament. They couldn't have them washed away or eliminated until Jesus came and was the final sacrifice for sin. So this was a covering over. At the same time, we must understand why did this have to happen on this particular day? Because this is the day of judgment. And every soul that would not be afflicted, or really what it's talked about is being humbled and brought low, dealing with their sins, he'd be cut off because this is the day of judgment. Anybody would do any work on that day Reason being is because nobody could do any work to accomplish this. It's all done by God, and it was only going to be able to be fulfilled by Jesus Christ. The same soul will I destroy among his, from among his people. So the Day of Atonement is a day of judgment for those who have not either had their sins covered in the Old Testament era or ha having had their sins dealt with. Now you'll see there's a change, of course, in the New Testament. We see in Leviticus chapter 16, the way this was accomplished was by the high priest. The high priest was Aaron. Aaron was the one who had to do this once a year on the seventh month, tenth day on the Day of Atonement. Leviticus 16.5, He shall take of the congregation, the children of Israel, two kids of the goats for a sin offering. Speaking of the two aspects of the sin offering, which involved Jesus, and one ram for the burnt offering. Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering for his health and his atonement for himself and for his house. <clears throat> and he take the two goats, present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. It says in verse 8, He cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord, the other lot for the scapegoat. He's going to bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. That's one aspect of what Jesus was be doing. The second, it says, the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for, the scape, for a scapegoat into the wilderness. This first one was where he'd offer him for a sin, that was him being killed, the one goat, which is what happened to Jesus, who is the fulfillment of this. They would kill the goat and they do something with his blood. Jesus was killed in order so that his death then, his blood then, would be shed and it would be able to take it up and pour it out on the mercy seat in heaven, which is what he eventually did. We see in verse 10, this is the goat that was a scapegoat, and he was presented alive before the Lord. This one wasn't killed. So we see this over in verse 15, where the one's killed, 
Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering, that is, for the people, bring his blood within the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. Well, that was what they did in the Old Testament era. Then we come down to verse 21. Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat, and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel, and all their transgressions, in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send them away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. So this one is one that's alive. And this is put on the head, all the sins being laid upon the goat. And here he says, the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities into a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. Now this speaks of what Jesus did, because the one goat being killed was Jesus' physical death. The one goat having the hands laid upon him was then all the sins laid upon him, and then Jesus, his spirit and soul, left and was sent into a land not inhabited, which was hell, where Jesus went down to hell for three days and three nights to pay the price for sin to accomplish the redemption. Well, this is something that they did in the Old Testament, and it was the high priest who did it. We even see down in verse 29, this is a statute forever unto them. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you afflict your souls, do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be cleansed from all your sins before the Lord. This would bring a cleansing of their sins in the Old Testament era by a covering over for it, which is all they could do at that time. Now, of course, Jesus' final sacrifice and what he accomplished did away with sin in order to bring forth, of course, the, the putting away of sin so we could be free from sin in our life. We see over in John, of course, Jesus is the Lamb of God who was going to take away the sin of the world. John 1, 29, next day John seeth Jesus coming to him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus is the one who did that. Now, we must understand this day of atonement, which we saw is a day of judgment. There's two aspects to this judgment, this particular day of judgment. The first as aspect is the judgment that Jesus brought in the time of the Jubilee, which you'll see in a moment, bringing judgment upon Satan and bringing liberty to mankind which was culminated with when he accomplished the redemption and brought salvation to mankind. The second aspect is the judgment which is going to come at the end, which is the judgment first on the church, and then the judgment that comes on the nations. We see that this judgment happened against the enemy Satan in this first aspect, as it says over in John chapter 16, verse 11 when he's talking about what the Holy Spirit convicts us of, verse 11, of judgment, because the prince of this world, it says, is judged. More literally, though, this is a perfect tense verb, and that is important. The prince is talking about the ruler of this world, talking about the devil. It's a perfect tense. The perfect tense in the Greek is that which would be translated has been judged as Young springs out. The perfect tense shows completed action in the past with present results at the time of speaking. Meaning, this is making a statement, he has been judged in the past with this ongoing continuing effect in the present results at the time of speaking. And you'll see this is exactly what Jesus accomplished. He actually brought judgment against the enemy in his first coming. And this was, uh, again, in fulfillment of the beginning, fulfillment of the seventh, tenth, seventh month, tenth day, day of, Jubil day of atonement, which is the judgment upon coming in to Satan and also against all of his works. We see over in Leviticus chapter 25 as we talk about this first aspects, uh, aspect. Verse 9. It says, Thou shalt cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. That's the Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. And this is something they had to do every 50 years. It was a rehearsal for the fact of what Jesus would do in his first coming in order to 
destroy the works of the enemy, and to bring salvation unto mankind. We see the fact over in verse 10, you shall hallow the 50th year, proclaim liberty throughout all the land and all the inhabitants thereof. It'll be a jubilee unto you, and you should return every man into his possession. You'll return every man into his family. Notice, it was a pro proclaiming liberty, and there was a restoration, a restoration of possessions and restoration to the family. So this speaks of them coming back out of bondage and being restored. We see in verse 11, and you believe shall the fiftieth year be unto you, you shall not sow, neither reap that which you grow of itself, nor gather the grapes in it of the vine and the rest. It was the fiftieth year, and this was to happen every fifty years as a reminder, essentially, pointing towards what Jesus would accomplish when he came. We see over in Isaiah chapter 61. In Isaiah 61, in verse 1, he says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, which is the year of Jubilee, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Notice that this is speaking about what Jesus would accomplish in his coming. And the first part is the first aspect of what he would accomplish in his first coming, of this fulfillment of the Day of Atonement, the Day of Judgment. He was going to preach good tidings. He's going to bind up the brokenhearted, bring liberty, bring the people out of prison, and bring the acceptable year of the Lord. That's what he did in his first coming. Then it also speaks of the day of the vengeance of our God. That's not what he did in his first coming. He did that in, he was going to do that in his second coming. The reason we know this is because we come over to Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Here at Nazareth, when Jesus stood up and he was reading out of the book of Isaiah in that very same place, he said, The Spirit of the Lord's upon me. Because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering his sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he stopped. He didn't mention about bringing this vengeance of our God because that wasn't what he came to bring in his first coming. His first coming was the first aspect of the fulfillment of the, the Jubilee bringing the Jubilee, which is the fulfillment of the Day of Atonement. And so here we see this is declared of what he's going to accomplish. But understand that in bringing this forth, as we see, what was he doing? He was bringing healing. He was bringing deliverance. He was going to destroy the works of the enemy. And that's exactly what Jesus came to do. We even say, see it was spoken of in 1 John 3, 8, the purpose that he came. The last part of this verse says, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. He began to do it when he first came and started his ministry, casting out the demons, healing the sick, setting the people free, bringing man to liberty, which is the Jubilee. So this is the beginning fulfillment of this Day of Atonement on the first coming of Jesus. And this occurred here, the first day of, the day of Atonement at this time was in 26 A.D. Now, let's talk about how we see this coming to pass. Over in Mark, in chapter 1, verse 2, he said, As it's written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. That was John the Baptist coming and preparing the way for the Lord. He's the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And that's John, baptizing the wilderness, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, getting them ready for the coming of the Lord. Verse 5, They went out unto him all the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. And then we come down to verse 9, and we see Jesus coming came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in the Jordan. And after that, we come to verse 12, and we see that then immediately the Spirit driveth him in the wilderness. Actually, if we back up, we see what happened. After when he was baptized, this is when the heavens were open. 
the Spirit like a dove descending upon him, that's the Holy Spirit, anointing coming upon him, and the voice from heaven saying, my, Thou art my Son, beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. So here this anointing for his ministry is upon him, the Holy Spirit. And he says, Immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. And there he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted of Satan, and was in the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. Then we come to verse 14, and after John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. This is the beginning of his ministry, when he's preaching the gospel. But before that, he was being tempted by the devil for those 40 days. And then in verse 15, Jesus makes a statement saying, the time. And this refers to a fixed, definite time, specific time, is fulfilled, or more literally, has been fulfilled, being the perfect tense. It has been fulfilled, he's declaring, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. This is the beginning of his ministry, and this is the beginning of the fulfillment of the judgment that's coming against Satan to bring a man out of bondage and bring him unto liberty, which is what this is all about. We go over to Luke's account in chapter 3. In Luke's account in chapter 3, we pick up in verse 21, when Jesus was baptized and praying and the heavens was open. Here's where the Holy Spirit descending a bodily shape like a dove upon him. A voice came from heaven and said, Thou art my beloved Son, and thee I'm well pleased. Now notice what it says in verse 23. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. That's telling you about the time. When it says about, this can also mean nearly because he wasn't quite 30 years of age, because he was born at the time of tabernacles. We pointed that out before. Tabernacles is the seventh month, 15th day. He was born during the time of tabernacles. This is talking about the Day of Atonement, which is the seventh month, 10th day. So this is a few days prior to that. So this is telling you the time when all this is happening. This is happening in the seventh month at the time of the Day of Atonement, Jubilee, seventh month, tenth day, he's about 30 days, being as opposed to the son of Joseph, which is the son of Heli, and it begins to trace the lineage all the way back to uh, the, the God, where at the very, uh, from verse 23 all the way to verse 38. Now, after that, we come to chapter 4. Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So what was he doing? Forty days, tempted of the devil. The forty days period before the seventh month, tenth day, we'd go back ten days, and then the lunar calendar is thirty days, so we go back another thirty days, and that would be the begin beginning of the sixth month. The sixth month is known as a lull. It is the month of repentance. So there were thirty days, and then ten days up to that, that's the forty days of being tempted by the devil, and that is the time of repentance where someone was supposed to be turning towards the Lord. And of course, in this case, it was the temptation coming against Jesus as he was being tempted by the devil for those particular 40 days. After that, after that temptation is over, we come to verse 14. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him throughout all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. He began to teach immediately as he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And then it says, he came to Nazareth, which he'd been brought up, custom was, came into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. Now why would that be? Because this is the time of when the fulfillment would be talked about because Isaiah 61 they knew was the talking about this time when the Messiah would come at this particular time in fulfillment of the Jubilee because it was going to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. So they give him this book, the prophet Isaiah. When he opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And here, this is from Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, set me to heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to the captives, recovering a sight to the blind, and set at liberty them that are bruised and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He's declaring exactly that what is that time of the year about the Jubilee. But then he does something after that. 
He closed the book, gave it again to the minister, and sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. In other words, this time of what it said about in Isaiah chapter 61 of the Jubilee coming to bring liberty and to bring people out of captivity, it's been fulfilled. And it's interesting when he says it's been fulfilled, he's declaring this, it already has been fulfilled. This is why the perfect tense is there, meaning action completed in the past with present results at the time of speaking. The reason the present tense would be used is because he already had started his ministry a few days before. Because this was the time when he went into Nazareth and stood up to read. That was on the Sabbath. Well, this, this wasn't the time of the tenth day. It wasn't the Sabbath that particular year at all. In this particular time, we see that in 26 AD, that the seventh month, the tenth day, was on a Wednesday. But the seventh month, 13th day, was the Saturday Sabbath. That's why he's saying, this has already been fulfilled. It's already been started. My ministry has started. I'm bringing forth the liberty. The Jubilee is here. He, is, of course, is the Jubilee to bring forth the liberty and freedom and, of course, to bring forth salvation. And it was the judgment upon Satan as he comes to begin to destroy the works of the enemy. Well, what did they think about that? They didn't like that at all. All bear him witness and wonder the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? They began to doubt. He said unto them, we will sure, he, You will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. He said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth. And he's saying that they're not going to accept the gospel. The Jews weren't. And that's right, they didn't. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months. He's really prophetically speaking of the time of his ministry, which was three years and six months long. When great famine was throughout all the land. Unto none of them was Elias son unto Sarepta, the city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And she's the only one. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elias the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Tyrian. He's the only one speaking of the fact that there weren't very many who were receiving the ministry. And he's pointing out the fact that the Jews weren't going to be receiving the ministry either. Very few would. Oh, when they heard that, they got mad. When they, they all in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, saying he's not going to, only going to come to certain ones that are going to receive. And they, of course, weren't going to receive because they were not accepting who he was. They thought he was just Joseph's son instead of realizing who he really was. He rose up and thrust them out of the city, led them to the brow of the hill where in the city was built. They might cast them down headlong. They wanted to kill them, throw them down off the hill. Well, passing through the midst of them, he went his way. They couldn't touch him. Of course, I'm sure the angels of God were protecting him from any kinds of attack that would come. And this is then showing forth the fact that Jesus began his ministry. This is the time of the seventh month, the tenth day, in fulfillment of this. It was a fixed, definite time, and it was the acceptable year, which is the year of Jubilee. So he began that. And of course, then he went and continued to minister the gospel, cast out the demons, heal the sick, set the people free for three and a half years of ministry. And did they receive the ministry? No, they didn't. Luke chapter 13, verse 6, shows through the parable he said, he spake also this parable, a certain man had a fig tree. The fig tree nation is the Jews. Planted in his vineyard, he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Meaning the fruit would show that the ministry had been received. Now there wasn't any fruit from the ministry that, that had been brought forth to the fig tree. Then he said to the dresser of this vineyard, behold, these three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Three years he'd been ministering at the He's talking about prophetically here in this parable where they hadn't responded at all. There was no fruit from the ministry. And the guy's saying, cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? He answered and said, Lord, let alone this year till I shall dig about it and dung it. If it bear fruit, well. If not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Well, that was going to be another. It's going to go on beyond the three years. 
And how long did Jesus minister? Three and a half years. And after that, then that was the end. They, they, they were cut off, uh, when he was cut off. So this speaks of the time of Jesus. And of course, what did he do? After that, he went to the cross. He paid the price for sin. He accomplished the redemption. He's the firstborn from spiritual death unto spiritual life. He brought salvation and accomplished it, brought man to the place where he could now be born again, come into relationship, have, get, get a brand new spirit, and salvation came. This is the first aspect of the fulfillment of this judgment, the Day of Atonement judgment, which was bringing judgment against the works of the enemy and bringing man out of bondage, out of all the sickness, disease, bondage to the devil, bringing him into liberty, which is what Jubilee was all about. But there's a second fulfillment, and that's what we're going to talk about from this point on today. The second fulfillment is what is going to come. We see in Isaiah chapter 61, remember, after the acceptable year of the Lord, which is the year of Jubilee, and the day of vengeance of our God. That's the time of judgment at the end. And that is what he is going to be bringing here and when the time is coming up shortly, as we will talk about. This judgment is on the church first and then also on the nations. The reason why we say the church first is because the scripture declares in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. If at first, this is the word which means first in time, it first begin at us. What shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? Well, they're not gonna, they're gonna be in trouble for sure. If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Well, the ungodly and the sinner, they're in trouble for sure. They're not gonna be saved. But when he says, if the righteous here, this is talking about those who are, the only ones who are going to make it through are the righteous. And who are the righteous? Not only those who are born again, but those who are doing the word of righteousness. Remember what it says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. The word doeth is in the present tense, meaning doing, ongoing, continuous action. He is doing. That's why Young's translates it, showing the ongoing of the tense, is going, the ongoing of the action of the verb, is doing the righteousness. So, we go back to 1 Peter. <clears throat> it's the righteous, those ones who are born again and are doing the word of righteousness. They're the ones, it says, and it says scarcely. This word scarcely, we put the cursor over this word, it's a word mollus, which means with difficulty and not easily. That's because you've got to overcome. You've got to overcome sin, you've got to overcome the devil, you've got to overcome the world, you've got to overcome the flesh, you've got to overcome anything that would try to hinder you from walking in the way of righteousness. And then when it says be saved, it sounds like it's already accomplished as a past tense, but it's a mistake in the translation in the way it should be translated correctly from the Greek, because it is a present tense. A present tense, and the passive voice, which is the way you translate one of those verbs, it would mean the righteous, not easily and with difficulty, are being saved continually. Are continually being saved. God is doing this work as we are walking in his ways, doing the word of righteousness. So here he's pointing out, of course, this judgment's coming to the house of God, and it's the righteous ones who are being saved. Now, we come over to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the King James says, and by our gathering together unto him. Let's look at this verse for a moment. The word coming is the word parousia. This is speaking about the second coming of Jesus in most cases, and it is in this case. The second coming of, Jesus, of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And then it says, by our gathering together unto him. Many people have tried to split this apart to say there's a coming as a general term, and then there is a gathering together unto him, talking about it being a separate thing, thinking it happens at a certain particular time. This is a favorite of the pre-tribula rapture, pre-tribulational rapture belief. Well, there's a mistake here. Notice the first word by. I put the cursor over it. It is a preposition, hooper, which means by in this case. Then we come to the other by. Notice it's italicized. I put the cursor over it. There's nothing coming up in the lower window. The lower window shows the, if there's a Greek or a Hebrew word behind that, supporting that translation. Well, there isn't one. It shouldn't be there. It literally says, this is why Young's eliminates that. It says, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him, meaning it's all one event. The coming also is the gathering together. When he comes, he's going to gather us together unto him. So that's talking about the rapture or the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air. It goes on and says, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. They're thinking this day when he comes back and catches them up, it's going to happen right now, near. Let no man deceive you by any means, he says. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So what day is he talking about? The day of Christ when he would come and catch the church up to meet him in the air, the rapture of the church. So he says that day is not going to come except there come a falling away first. First in time. What's the falling away? It's this word apostasia, which means, and where we get our word apostasy from, which means a rebellion or a defection from truth. A rebellion away from truth, when you look it up in the lexicons. A turning away, essentially. It's not walking in the ways of the Lord anymore. That's going to happen. That says that's going to happen before. Has that happened? No. And then the other thing it says is going to happen, the man of sin be revealed. Well, that's the Antichrist, the son of perdition. So what does that tell us? That tells us that this time of when this judgment is going to be coming, remember, first it's coming to the church. And what would happen in the judgment of the church? It's going to basically separate who's going to walk and be righteous and who are not going to be the righteous ones. Well, isn't that exactly what's going to happen when there's an apostasy and a defection from truth? The ones that are right will be the ones that are the righteous ones. The ones that won't be, they're the ones that will be in the fallaway crowd. There will be a separation. Only the ones who are the righteous ones will then be, are being saved, are the ones that will pass the test on the judgment that is coming to the church. And we've already seen that and we talked about it out of Revelation chapter 2 and 3, where we saw the judgment coming to the churches. Remember, Revelation is a book of judgment. And it begins with the judgment in the church in Revelation 2 and 3. We see those who passed the test by overcoming and walking in the ways of the Lord. But we see those who didn't pass the test if they wouldn't repent and what he told them. Remember the one who, if he wouldn't repent, his candlestick would be removed. The light would be removed. There was another one where he told them if he wouldn't repent, he'd come and fight against them with his mouth. There was another case where that was the Je Jezebel, where if she wouldn't repent, she's going to be cast into great tribulation, and her children, her followers, were going to be killed as well. And then we come over in, in the third chapter. That's where the ones that were, def a few were not defiled at Sardis, but the, all the defiled ones, they were, and they were going to have their names blotted out of the book of life in verse 5. And then in verse 16, where it talks about the church at Laodicea, it said those guys... They weren't hot for God at all, and they were going to be spewed out of his mouth. Otherwise, he's declaring, if these guys don't repent and walk in the ways of the Lord, that they are not going to be in the righteous group that's going to come through. Instead, they're going to be spewed out. They're going to be a part of the fallaway crowd. Now, another thing we must realize is that the judgment here that is going to come on the nations which will be coming next Many people have thought that this can come at any time, you know, that Jesus can come back at any time and all these kinds of things. Well, that's not so. Why is it? Because of the fact that 
the, the time that man has to rule the earth is a lease of 6,000 years long, and that lease is not up. In fact, many people in the pre-tribulation or rapture belief system have said, well, there's no prophecies hindering Jesus coming. He can come at any time, and they can declare the imminency. He can come at any time. Well, they fail. That's true. There isn't any prophecies to hinder, but they fail to understand one major thing. The lease is not up. And until the lease is up, he cannot come. God is not going to do things contrary to what is correct. This is why eminency is a lie. You must understand, in Psalms 115, verse 16, look at the statement that's made. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth has he given to the children or the sons of men. He gave the earth into the hands of man to rule and to reign. He was given for a period of 6,000 years, which was the six days. There were seven days of creation, and we know that a day, as we see in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. One day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Each day is a thousand years. The six days were the six thousand years that man was going to be able to rule the earth. The seventh day that God rested, the reason is because man wasn't going to be ruling then, and God was going to be doing it instead. And that's the seventh thousand year period where the millennial reign of Jesus is. Somebody have thought, well, is this really talking about a thousand years for each day? It sure is. Remember in Revelation chapter 20, it talks about a thousand year reign many times over and over and over, talking about the thousand years. And that is the millennial reign of Jesus Christ in the seventh thousandth year period. So, of course, what happened? Man disobeyed. And what happened? He gave the authority that had been given into him, his hands, into the hands of Satan. And we see this is over in Luke chapter 4. Look at the statement that Satan makes to Jesus during the temptations. Verse 6, the devil said to him, all this authority, not power, it's the word exousia, meaning authority. Young corrects this. All this authority will I give it unto you, because what he's talking about is all these kingdoms of the world. And these are all, of course, satanic kingdoms that had come from his rule and reign throughout history, from the time it was given into his hands after the fall of man. All this authority will I give thee, and the glory of them. Now, why could he do that? For that is delivered unto me. He makes a statement. This authority was delivered, it was given unto me given into my hands. Literally is what that word says in the Greek. And that's right. In the past, perfect tense, completed action, when Adam fell, continuing results throughout the time, he's continued to have it. And it was passive voice, meaning he didn't do anything as far as getting it, but it was given to him by another. And who was that? It was Adam at the time of the fall of man. So, Satan's had authority. That's why we see all these evil kingdoms that have operated for all of these thousands of years. Now, you must understand that this was a lease. Luke 20, verse 9. Then began he to speak to the people this parable. A certain man, this is pointing towards God, planted a vineyard, that's what he, in the earth, which made the earth, and let... He let, this word let is the word which means a lease. It is referring to a lease, to lease something out, let it out, uh, to let it out for hire, it's the word for a lease. To let it forth to husbandmen, and went into a far country for a long time. Well, the father went into, a country, into heaven for a long time. What was that? That was the 6,000 years of man. How do we know it's 6,000 years? Not only from the six days, but we also actually can know it from over in Genesis chapter 6. 
in verse 3. This is when the time of the flood, when man was so evil and he was going to destroy man, the wickedness was so great. In verse 3, the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. He was fed up with them. For that he also is flesh, but there's another word here. He going astray and erring as flesh. That's why Young's brings it in there, erring their flesh. They continued to reject God's word and not follow his way. Remember, there was a group called the sons of God that followed the way of the Lord. And Noah was the last one. And all the rest of them had turned away. And all the sons of men were the ones that did not follow the way of the Lord and rejected it. Notice, so he says, in his air in their flesh, then he says, yet his days shall be 120 years. The yet actually isn't there, but it really is making a statement, his days be 120 years. What's this talking about? It's not talking about the lifespan of man. Many people have assumed it. That's false. Abraham lived 175 years. Uh, I think it was uh, Isaac lived 180, I think it was. Um, Ishmael lived 137 or something like that. Uh, several of them, they lived beyond that. Jacob lived 140 years or so. All these guys lived more than that. Well, that tells you something. They can't be talking about 120 years as a lifespan. Otherwise, the, everybody would have to have been gone by 120 years. What's it talking about? It's talking about the Jubilee years. The Jubilee year was every 50 years. They called it the year of Jubilee, time and time again. The Jubilee years. 120 Jubilee years, which were 50 years, 120 times 50, is 6,000. That's what he's speaking of. That the days that man has in control of the earth were 120 jubilee years, which is 6,000 years. And so God was going to have to put up with this thing for 6,000 years to deal with man. Of course, he was ready to wipe them all out and finish them all off. But he found one person who had grace in the sight of God, which was Noah. And, of course, he, instead of wiping out the whole human race and the whole group, Noah got preserved. Well, it's interesting that as he got preserved, then the reason was, of course, he was righteous. And also we see some important things about this particular time. But first of all, we just want to mention this, that from the time of the fall of man, there were 4,000 years, which is the four days, 4,000 years, until Christ came and accomplished the redemption. We see this actually brought out. It's over in uh, John. When we understand the revelation that is being brought forth. In John chapter 11, when Lazarus got raised from the dead, it's interesting, Lazarus, who God helps of Bethany. Bethany means house of misery. Lazarus represents man who, who is in a house of misery because he's spiritually dead. Not just the fact that he was physically sick. This, is, this is a, has a deeper revelation. He was spiritually dead. From the town of Mary, which means their rebellion, and her sister Martha, she was rebellious. Mankind was rebellion, rebellious, and that's why the fall of man occurred. Well, there it talks about Lazarus was sick. Well, he wasn't just sick. This is a word which actually means weak, feeble, without strength, and powerless. He could do nothing about his state that he was in, which is what? Spiritually dead, under the dominion of Satan. And where was his destiny when he died? To go to hell and be under Satan's dominion, who had the keys of hell and death for eternity, unless somebody did something about it. So he is in a, that state. What a terrible state to be in. And then he makes a statement. This sickness, this weakness, this lack of strength is not unto death, but for the glory of God. What's going to bring the glory of God if God brought him out of that spiritual dead state? That the Son of God might be glorified thereby. We're not talking about just him being raised from physical sickness that we died. He did die, remember. 
But no, this is talking about man coming out of spiritual death that he was, is what it's really pointing towards. And we even see when he said about him being dead, isn't it interesting that in verse 17, when they, then when Jesus came, he found that he'd lain in the grave four days already. Why was that important? Because it's pointing out the fact that the real one who is talking about is man spiritually dead for four days of four thousand years he'd been dead and he says that they said one more time here by Martha in verse 39 when they said take away the stone and Martha the sister of him said Lord by this time he think of he's been dead four days man had been spiritually dead four thousand years chronologists who have gone through the Bible have seen that the, when they look at the time from Jesus when he accomplished the redemption, and they go back through the Bible, they see it's 4,000 years. Many people have had different times. They thought Some have thought it was at 4,004 4, B.C. was when the beginning happened. Others were at different times. It's actually at 3971. There's a little bit of differences, but that's the real time that goes up to 30 A.D. when Jesus accomplished the redemption. That's exactly the 4,000-year period. So... 4,000 years was till then. Then there's going to be, after that, what do we see is going to happen? Well, the church age begins, and we have the 2,000 years. Exodus 19 speaks of this time when it says in verse 1, In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day they came into the wilderness of Sinai, this is the third month. The third month is Siwan, on the Hebrew calendar, which is the time of Pentecost. Pentecost is when the liberty came. And remember, the, in the Old Testament era, this second feast season was called the Feast of Weeks. But it's changed now. In the New Testament, they didn't call it the Feast of Weeks. Why? Because there's been a change. It's the Feast of Pentecost. And what's Pentecost mean? Fifty. What does that mean? Fifty days after Jesus had been the first fruits had put his, gone up and his blood put on the uh, mercy seat in heaven. Fifty days after that, that's the number of what well, Jubilees about every 50 years. It's, 50 is the number of liberty. That was when liberty was going to come to everybody who was on earth who could get born again at the time of the day of Pentecost. That's why it's called the day of Pentecost. It's never called the Feast of Weeks in the New Testament era. It's changed. It's now the time of liberty because Jesus has brought it forth. Well, we come to verse 10. The Lord said to Moses, Moses is a type of Christ, go into the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow. That's two days. That'd be 2,000 years. That's the church age. Let them, that's all of us, wash their clothes. And this is perform the work of a fooler, which is to wash you as white as snow. We're to get washed clean and be sanctified before the Lord. Be ready against the third day. The third day? Well, that's after that. That would be the, begin the time of the beginning of the seventh thousandth year period. For the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all of the people. We come to verse 14. So Moses went down from the mountain to people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. He said, be ready against the third day. Come not as your wives. And look what happens on the third day. It came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings. Thunders and lightnings in Scripture, which you'll see tonight when we go through more about this judgment, is judgments being poured out. This means judgments are going to happen first. A thick cloud upon the mount, and then it says the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so the people in the camp trembled. And that trumpet is the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air. The last trump is what this is speaking of. We see in verse 17, Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. That's what we're going to be doing. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. And what happened? We're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven for 10 days. We're going to be up there with him before we come back for the time of when there's the final judgment. Now, in order to see this happen, you must understand that Jesus had some things he had to do. And it's important for us to understand what was going on. In giving 
the earth into the hands of Adam, uh, he had the right to the rule of the earth. Well, when that got into the hands of Satan, now he had the right to it. Well, we come over to Jeremiah chapter 32. Jeremiah chapter 32. This is Jeremiah in verse, that's 32 that is, verse 6. Jeremiah said, that the Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Behold, Hanamiel, the son of Shalom, thine uncle, shall come unto thee, saying, Buy thee my field, that's an anathest, for the right of redemption is thine to buy it. The right of redemption? Well, that's something that's important to know about. And he goes on and says, Hanamiel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison according to the word of the Lord and said unto me, Buy my field, I pray thee, that's in Anathoth, which is the country of Benjamin, for the right of inheritance is thine, and redemption, which means the right of redemption, this word means, is thine, buy it for thyself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. Two things are spoken of here, the right of inheritance and the right of redemption. Why all did something need to be done about this? Because the right of redemption and the right of inheritance had to come into the hands of Jesus, and it had to be purchased by a man, and Jeremiah was given this assignment. Let's go back and look at this in verse 7. Hanamiel means God is gracious. Now that means talk, speaking about the gracious God. The son of Shalom, which means retribution. Retribution means one who pays back the punishment for evil. Otherwise, the gracious God is going to pay somebody back for the evil they've done. Who's going to get paid back? The devil is going to get paid back for the evil that he has done to mankind and all that he has done in causing all this destruction that has occurred from the fall of man onward. And he says, buy thee my field that's an anathoth. The field is speaking of the earth. He's going to buy this thing. When it speaks of anathoth, we go back over here to Jeremiah 29, verse 27. He said, now therefore, why hast thou not reproved Jeremiah of anathoth? That's where he was from. The word anathoth means affliction a place of affliction. It was also a place called a poor place over in Isaiah chapter 10, as you'll see in verse 30. He says, Lift up thy voice, O daughter of Galem, cause to be heard in Laish, O poor Anathoth. Anathoth was a place of, of affliction where it was poor. And what was that? That was the earth. The earth now was in a terrible shape because of the fall of man. So the gracious God, as we go back here and we see what's being said in Jeremiah 32, verse 7, the gracious God who's going to pay back retribution against the one who did evil, against the devil, and he's telling him that he's supposed to buy this field, pointing towards earth, is what it's talking about, that is in a place of affliction and is poor, a place of ter terrible state, and it was. Why? Because the right of redemption is dying to buy it. The right of redemption, they could buy back land that had been forfeited and given up. <laughs> the earth had been given up by Adam into the hands of Satan. And so somebody had to ha buy this thing back that's the right of redemption, he said, is yours. Come to verse 8. So Hanamiel, the gracious God, he comes to them in the court of the prison because Jeremiah is in prison. Well, what does that mean? Man, in the state that he's in, he's in prison spiritually. He's in prison. The devil has control of him. He's imprisoned in spiritual death, and all his destination is hell after he would die. According to the word of the Lord, he said, Buy me my field, I pray thee, it's Anatha. And notice what else it says, which is in the country of Benjamin. 
Benjamin means the son of the right hand. Well, who's the son of the right hand? Jesus. That means this is really the Lord's. He, the earth belongs to him. The earth is the Lord, see, the Bible says. And yet it had been given into the hands of Satan. And he says this is in the country of the son of the right hand. For the right of inheritance is yours. Otherwise, you've got to be able to inherit this thing. And the right of redemption is yours. Two things we've got to have. The right of redemption, and we also have to have the right of inheritance. And so he tells them to buy it for himself. So, I bought the field of Hannah Meal. My uncle's son was in Anna, and weighed him the money, even 17 shekels of silver. He paid 17 shekels. What's so important about 17? Because 17 in Scripture is the number of reversing the curse or ending evil. It's the number of reversing a curse or ending evil. You'll see this. Numbers can have tremendous significance in bringing revelation of what things that are said in the Word of God. This is when the flood was over in Genesis chapter 8, verse 4. The ark rested in the seventh month on the seventeenth day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. The word Ararat means the curse reversed. The reversing of the curse upon the earth that came because of the fall of man. Somebody is going to reverse that curse. It's the Lord. And this is where after the flood was over, the ark rested in the seventh month here on this time, in the seventeenth day, because seventeen is the number of reversing the curse. It also was the number of the beginning of the judgment we see in Genesis 17, 11, or 7, 11, excuse me. In the 600th year of Noah's life in the second month, the seventeenth day of the month, same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were open. Otherwise, it's the beginning of the judgment released to end the evil in the earth because he's going to wipe them all out. Everybody's gone. Get, all going to get killed. The whole place is going to be wiped out in the flood. So that was the beginning of the destruction of that. We see 17 also revealed in Genesis 37, verse 2. These are the generations of Jacob. Jo Joseph being 17 years old, He's going to do something now. It's important. Was feeding the flock with his brethren. The lad was with the sons of Bilhan, with the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto their, his father their evil report. He told them about the evil. Otherwise, he's exposing the evil to stop the evil that was going on. We see another place in chapter 47, verse 28. Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. Egypt was not the place you want to be. That was a place of bondage and evil. So the whole age of Jacob was 147. Remember, he lived more than, he was 147 years old. He was 130 before he came there. And then he was there 17 years. Well, 17 years after he died, that was the end of his time of being in there, of being in an evil place, being in the evil land. We can even see 17 pointed out in 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 21, Rehoboam, the son of Jeroboam, reigned in Judah. He was 41 years old, began to reign, and 17 years in he reigned in Jerusalem. This guy was a, one of the evil ones. And after 17 years, that was the end of his reign. The evil was going to be stopped and put away. Evil was stopped because he, he was an evil person. We also see another one over in 2 Kings, Chapter 13, here it speaks about um, Joash, the son of Ahaziah, the king of Judah. Joaz, the son of Judah, began to reign over Israel and Jer in uh, Samaria and reigned 17 years. And he was evil too. He did evil in the sight. But after 17 years, he ain't going to reign any more than that. That was the end of the evil of him. We see that these kings were shown this. 
and the 17 shekels paid for the land to redeem it reversed the curse upon the earth, and it's a type of the ending of the evil. That's what he's talking about. Let's go back to Jeremiah. So why, that's why I had to pay 17 shekels for this thing. This is the price that is going to be paid that is going to end the evil. And he's buying this land. He's buying the land that was given into the hands of Satan, which is the earth. So, we come now to verse 10. I subscribe the evidence. This means the book. It's written. The word subscribe means to write. It was written in a book. This is actually the book, word that means book. And sealed it and took witnesses and weighed him the money and the balances. This, is a, this was a deed of purchase, see. When he talks about this book, this, in this context, you can see it here, means a deed of purchase. It could mean a certificate of divorce or some legal document. But in this case, because it's the purchase of land, it is a deed of purchase. And what is this? This is the title deed to the earth. He's buying back. He's buying it even though he's in prison. He's buying it back at the direction of God, which has to be purchased in order to be able to reclaim the earth, which what Jesus, of course, was going to come to do. Verse 11, I took the evidence of the purchase, the book of this purchase, the possession, that was sealed according to the law and custom. It was sealed, and that which was open. It was sealed on the back side and on the inside. There was the writing on the inside and the back side and had these seals on it. I gave the evidence of the purchase unto Barak, Baruch, the son of Neriah. He was the lamp of Jehovah, the son of Messiah, who was the shelter. What this means is he was the one who was blessed, who was going to be a light, who would be a shelter and a protection for this. In the sight of Hanamiel, the son, my uncle's son, in the presence of the witnesses, subscribed the book of the purchase before all the Jews that sat in the court of the prison. Everybody was in prison. Man was in spiritual prison. And what they do with it? They took the evidence of the purchase, which is sealed, and this evidence, which is open, they put them in an earthen vessel that it may continue many days. Otherwise, it got sealed up and it's put away. Well, it's put away for all those years. And why was that? It had to be put away until the time when it could be opened. And that's only when Jesus could do this. So we see we have the right of the redemption, and we also have the right of possession of inheritance. So he purchased this thing as the title deed to the earth. And let's go back to that one point that we read earlier. The right of inheritance and the right of redemption. The only person who's going to be able to open this up has to have the right of inheritance and the right of redemption. Well, the right of redemption, who would do that? Had to be a kinsman redeemer, didn't it? Had to be a man. Jesus, the Word, became flesh. He became a man. Man had the right to redeem, because man could redeem the land. He could redeem himself, if possible. But could man pay a price in order to get him out of spiritual death and bondage to Satan? No. Nothing he could do about it. So there had to be someone else. And who's that? That's Jesus, the kinsman redeemer, who came. He's the one who had to become a man. God had to become a man in Christ, had to become a man, and to pay the price in order to accomplish the redemption, in order to liberate us. And that's what Jesus did. That's why God had to become a man. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself to accomplish this great work. And so, he is the one who had the right of redemption to do this. But also, there's the right of inheritance. And this right of inheritance, you've got to understand, this was a battle that went on. Look what we see. You see this. We we'll go back to what we talked about this lease before. Luke chapter 11, 20, verse 9. Look what it says. Here's where we speak to the people of the parable. A certain man planted a vineyard, let it out to husband, went into a far country for a long time. God plants the earth. He lets it out, gives the least to man. He goes to heaven. You know, he's been for a long time. He's in heaven waiting. And at the season, he sent a servant to the husbandmen 
that they should give him of the fruit of the vineyard, but the husband beat him and sent him away empty. Oh, the, the ones who came and preached the gospel, the prophets that came and called them to repentance and to get, you know, to turn to God. No, they didn't, they didn't turn to God whatsoever. They, they'd killed the prophets, didn't they? Again, he sent another servant. They beat him also and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty. The prophets were continually being killed time after time. He sent a third. They wounded him also and cast him out. Remember some of the ones that were sawn asunder? Uh, they were beaten. They were killed. All kinds of evil things, terrible things happened to all these prophets that God had sent. Now we come to verse 13. Then said the Lord of the vineyard, what shall I do? I'll send my beloved son. That's talking about sending Jesus. It may be that they'll reverence him when they see him. Or did mankind reverence Jesus? No, not at all. When the husbandmen saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, who's the husbandman? Husbandman is the one who's in charge of the earth. Well, who got in charge of the earth after the fall of man? Satan. So this is really, the husband is really a type of the evil spirits and Satan who see what's going on. And they were working through all the evil Jews, you know, that killed all those prophets, you know, to kill them all off when they came. Now we see the devil working, the husband saw him, and they reasoned among themselves saying, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. They thought if they killed Jesus, then the inheritance would be theirs forever, that they'd have control of the earth. Hmm. So they cast him out of the vineyard and they killed him. They thought it was done. They thought they had him. Hmm. No, it didn't work. Why is that so? Because they didn't understand the plan that God had. It was a mystery. 1 Corinthians 2.8 even says it, with none of the princes or the rulers of this world knew for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Why? Because Jesus was God, man, man and Christ, God and man together, who was accomplishing the redemption as the right of redemption. He went through the avenue of death, not only to pay the price to, for, in hell for three days and three nights, but what else did he do? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. For as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. He had to get the, that, he had to destroy the devil's power of death over mankind and deliver him through, through fear of death, because he was going to end up in hell for eternity, that's the way man was in the state he was in, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Well, there's no way out. So he accomplished this. And of course, through all this, what was he able to do? We even see the testimony that Jesus gave in Revelation 1.18. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, and amen, amen, and I have the keys of hell and of death. He went through that avenue that they should have never killed him. They made a big mistake. They didn't know what was going on. If they'd have known, they'd have never crucified the Lord of glory. But through that, he was able to not only pay the price to accomplish the redemption and bring forth the new birth, because Jesus was the first one born from spiritual death and the spiritual life, but also to take back the keys of hell and death from the devil so that man would not have to go there any longer, praise God. Well, he had the right of redemption by coming a man, but he also had this right of inheritance. Well, how do you get the right of inheritance? you got to be an heir. So Jesus comes. How is Jesus going to be an heir? Well, under the Old Testament, he was the final sacrifice to fulfill that. And he took away the first testament so he could bring forth the second. And he established the second as, first of all, he made it with the Father. Remember? We'll come over to Matthew chapter 26. What, what, was, what did he do here when he was ready to leave and go to the cross? He said, this is my blood of the New Testament. A New Testament, that's a new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. He made a new covenant with the, with the Father for mankind. He was a man, remember, so he could make this covenant. So this new covenant that he makes, this is the New Testament. Well, 
because he made that covenant, does that make him an heir? No. Why is that? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. For this cause, he's the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, he had to die. For the redemption of the transgressions under the first testament, he had to die for all these sins, that they which are called, which is all of mankind, might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And how could we do that, though? It's going to be through an heir, right? For where a testament is, the covenant, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Who made the testament? Jesus did with the Father. Well, that means he had to die. The testator had to die in order to see that testament be, have force. It didn't have any force. A will didn't have any force until someone dies. It's just a piece of paper, right? Someone has to die, and then it becomes into it. A testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it's of no strength at all while the testator liveth. This is another reason why he had to die. If they would have known that his death would bring the New Testament into being, they'd have never killed him. But he had to die before the Testament could become a force. And that's what he did. Now, in doing so also, does that mean the same Jesus came up out of hell? No, not the same spirit, because he had to get a brand new spirit. Remember when he's on the cross after he became sin, he, he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The father left him. Why? Because he had been made sin. Now he was spiritually dead and separated because he put himself in the same place that man was, spiritually dead state for man. And he went down to hell for three days and three nights and he was the first born from spiritual death unto spiritual life, the first born again. He's the first born of all creation as it says in Colossians 1.15. So he got born again, and also, now that's a new spirit he has. He takes back the keys of hell and death from the devil. He goes and preaches to the spirits that are in prison, the upper compartment of hell, which are the Old Testament righteous saints. They had to be judged as those who were, as men. We'll show you those scriptures. Look what he did after he came, after he came out of, he was born again in hell, by which he went and preached to the, under the spirits in prison. It's not talking about demons, it's talking about the people, the spirits that were in prison. Where were they in prison? In hell, in the upper compartment of hell. And what did he do for them? Chapter 4, verse 6 says, For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, the spirits in prison, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. They had to hear the gospel and receive it, and they did. And they all got born again. So, now the New Testament has come into manifestation because of the death of the testator. And Jesus now is a brand new spirit. He is what? He is now the heir. As he now is raised from the dead, Look what it says here. Hebrews 1, 2, Hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Verse 4, By so much better than angels, he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Because he's the heir. He got the inheritance. So this is how Jesus not only had the right of redemption, but also the right of inheritance. Now, one other thing we want to look at. Why is all this important? Because after Revelation chapter 2 and 3 with the judgment coming to the church, then we come to chapter 4, and this is where John is called up to heaven to show him the things that are going to happen. And so he's up there, and there's the throne in heaven, sees the one sit on the throne, and what he's, what's he going to see happen? He says in verse 4, he saw the throne four and twenty seats upon the saints, four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, had on their heads crowns of gold. These are all the righteous saints in heaven. And what's he see in the throne that's about to happen? Out of the throne proceeds lightnings and thunderings and voices. That's judgments ready to come. The judgments that are going to come upon the world, which is what was necessary to take back the earth. 
There were seven lamps of burning fire on the throne. There were seven spirits of God ready to carry all this stuff out. Now, who's going to be able to do something about this? We come to chapter 5. Verse 1, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. What is a book written within and on the back side? It is a title deed. Well, that's the thing that the title deed that was written, that was put in a, in a, a put in, for many days, just put in an earthen vessel. This is now the title deed that needs to be opened up to take back the earth. Someone, the only person who could do it was someone who had the right of redemption and the right of inheritance. Who had the right of redemption? Jesus, and he accomplished the redemption. Who had the right of inheritance? Jesus, who became the heir of all things. I saw a strong angel proclaim a loud voice, Who's worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof, to take back the earth? Remember, this is the, the purchase of the earth from the devil. No man in heaven, nor in earth, nor under the earth was able to open the book. He wept much. Nobody was found worthy to open it. Read the book. Ah, look at verse 5. One of the elders said to me, Weep not. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, that's Jesus, the root of David has prevailed. This is a word, nakao, which means to conquer and carried off the victory. He conquered and carried off the victory to open the book. Yeah, he could open it. He's the one that did this. Only the one who conquered and carried off the victory would have the inheritance and have accomplished the redemption. And that's what he did. And to loose the seven seals thereof, which is the opening up of the judgments that were going to be begin release, released in order to take back the possession of the earth. And that's exactly who is the one? It's Jesus. He is the one now who is able to take this back. We come down to verse 12. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. Here he's ready to start to open up this thing because he's the one who had accomplished this great thing. And we come to chapter 6 and verse 1. I saw the Lamb, that's Jesus, open one of the seals. And we see the noise of thunder, the beginning of the judgments that come. And the judgments begin to come. When is all this going to happen? At the end of the 6,000 years, the end of the lease is over. And now he's going to take it back. And what's the first thing that we see happening up in Revelation chapter 12? We see that there's going to be a war because he's going to kick all the evil spirits, Satan and all these evil spirits, out of heaven and out of the heavenlies where they've been able to operate. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. The great, great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He's cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. That's going to happen at the very beginning, right off the bat, Nissan day one, the attack is going to be on, and they're going to be all thrown out of the heavens, and they're going to be cast down to the earth. And then the judgments are going to begin to be rolled out. These judgments are going to happen, and there's going to be the taking back of the earth. At the same time, we see that the rapture of the church will happen at the end of the tribulation, and then will be the final judgment upon them. It's going to come. And we see this in Revelation. In Revelation, at the time when the catching up of the church is to meet the Lord in the air, what happens? The marriage of the Lamb will come. Revelation 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice, give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. His wife has made herself ready, prepared and ready. Who are the ones that are, make it? The righteous, remember. To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. What's the fine linen? The righteousness of the saints. All the righteous ones are the ones that are there. He says, blessed are those that are called in the marriage supper of the Lamb, because they're the ones that are with him, the righteous. Well, what's going to happen after that? And that's all going to happen on the seventh month, first day, which we don't know the day or hour, which speaks of the first day of the month when it occurs. 
which is the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets, which is the rapture catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air. Well, what's going to happen then? Well, after 10 days of the marriage supper in the Lamb, we come to the seventh day, 10th, seventh month, 10th day, and we have the final finishing off of the devil after all these judgments have been rolled out, and that's going to happen on the Armageddon battle on the seventh month, 10th day, elimination of the enemy. Look what it says. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was faithful and true, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. He had a name written of no man knew but himself. His clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. This is Jesus. His armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, clean and white. Who's that? All of us, the righteous saints that, are in, that have been there at the marriage. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that he with it should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. He hath in his vesture and his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. No question who it is. It's Jesus. Saw the angel standing in the sun, cried with a loud voice, saying to the fowls that fly in the midst of the heaven, Come and gather yourselves together in the supper of the great God, because they're all going to be destroyed, and the birds are going to all eat them up. They're going to eat the flesh of kings and of captains, mighty men, horses, them that sit on them, the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. They're going to try to fight against us all. <laughs> That's not going to work, but they're going to try. The beast was taken with him, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worship his image, and both were cast alive in the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. They go directly into the lake of fire. The remnant were slain with the sword of him, and followed the remnants, talking about the rest of the nations, that sat upon the horse, uh, with which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. They're all going to be destroyed, except for a few men that will be left that go into the millennial reign, which will begin to populate the millennial reign for the thousand-year reign of Jesus. And of course, he said, he, the angel came down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, which the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years. He's going to be bound, cast in the bottomless pit, shut him up and set a seal upon him. He should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. After that, he's loosed a little season and he's able to deceive the nations, and then he's, they're all going to be wiped out by the Father in the end. And then they're going to be judged and cast into the lake of fire. What we see is the fact that the Day of Atonement is a day of judgment. The first fulfillment was Jesus coming and beginning his ministry. And he destroyed the works of the devil and brought salvation and liberated and we're continuing in that, or even ourselves, of seeing the fruit of that, because we cast out the devils and heal the sick and destroy the works of the devil continually. We're carrying that out. It's ongoing. But then there's a second one. The second one comes at the end of the lease, which is coming up. At the end of that time, that's when the judgment is going to happen as the one who has the right of inheritance and has the right of redemption the one who prevailed and conquered is the one who can take this. He's the only one who could open up the book, the title deed to the earth that, he had, that God had Jeremiah bought in order to open up the seals, to begin to release the judgments, to bring forth the retaking of the earth. And that's exactly what is going to happen. And that is all the fulfillment of what the seventh month, tenth day, judgment, and of course the culmination of that is the end where the judgment is on the nations in the Battle of Armageddon, they all get wiped out. Satan gets put in the bottom, bottomless pit for a thousand years, and the false prophet and the Antichrist are thrown into the lake of fire. And then the millennial reign of Jesus Christ will come forth. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection on such the second death has no authority, it means. They shall be priests of God and Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. That is what we will be looking forward to, being with him for a thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Say this with me, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the mighty work of Jesus Christ in fulfillment 
of the Day of Atonement, which was in two aspects. His first coming, accomplishing the redemption, destroying the works of the devil in his three and a half year ministry, which has been ongoing work throughout the church age where we destroy the works of the devil. And the second aspect, it's coming up where he's going to take back the authority over the earth because he's the one that prevailed and conquered the enemy who has the right of redemption and the right of inheritance to open up that scroll, that title deed, and to release the judgments and to take back the authority over the earth and destroy the nations that have rejected him. I thank you for the work of Jesus Christ and the revelation in the word of God of what he's done and what he's going to do. I thank you that I will be one of the righteous. I will pass the test in the judgment coming to the church first and I will be with the Lord, caught up to meet the Lord in the air and be with him forever. And in the marriage supper of the Lamb, I'll be coming back and watching what happens as they'll try to fight against Jesus and his mighty army, they will be destroyed. I thank you. I will walk in the way of righteousness and I will see the fulfillment of the Day of Atonement judgment upon the nations that have rejected the Lord. I thank you, Lord. I will make sure that I'm walking in righteousness all the days of my life so I will be a part of that glorious church. Thank you for the mighty work that you've accomplished. Thank you for everything you did that was necessary to take back the authority over the earth and to reclaim it and to bring forth the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. I thank you for this mighty work that you've accomplished, and I praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. It is a tremendous thing that Jesus Christ did. He had to do it all. That's the only way. And it was a plan hidden in God. The devils didn't know it. They had never crucified him. They made the mistake of all mistakes by doing that. Praise God for the great work that he's accomplished. Make sure you're walking right with the Lord so you're going to be with him always. Father, thank you for all you brought forth. We'll be doers of your word and walk in righteousness and see this all come forth in these coming days. In Jesus' name, amen.